movement is motivation. Motion is the lotion. So once you get moving, a lot of times you get motivated. The gym's not enough. This is what I'm trying to basically say here. Going and doing a lifting session and broing out and just getting like muscular, that might have some benefits, but it can't really mimic that youthfulness that we're looking for. And so therefore I think you need other strategies. Mark Bell spent many years as a world ranked power lifter. His highest squat was actually over a thousand pounds. This was 1,080 pounds. He opened his super training gym in Sacramento and had people all over the world coming in to utilize his gym for free. And more recently, Mark has been working to extend his knowledge and share his information with more people through his top ranked podcast, Mark Bell's Power Project. When I'm around you, true, true story. When I came up to film with you, and I brought my oldest son, Jordan, along with me. When I came back, I changed what I was doing with my fitness, all right? Cool. It, it compelled me to like, let me get a sled. Let me find a way to, and that's the influence that you have, you know, because you're one of those people that you figured things out over time, experimenting with so many different things and you're sharing open-heartedly mm. and also you're constantly challenging yourself. So world record-breaking power lifter, excelling from there in bodybuilding, experimenting with so many different types of training. And you even recently ran a freaking marathon. Was it the Boston Marathon, right? Yeah. I got questions, man. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I would love to know what motivates you to keep challenging yourself after all these years? What what What's motivating you to keep getting up and getting after it? Sometimes motivation is an interesting thing to try to get a hold of, you know, to try to figure out, uh, especially if you're not competing in something. If you're competitive in something, then it's easier. So like for powerlifting, it was easier for me to get locked in. Powerlifting was something that kept calling to me. I, I tried to push it away a bunch of times, but it was like an old girlfriend <laughs> that just wanted to, wanted to be with me and I didn't want to be with her. But powerlifting always kind of reared its ugly head. I, I was... Uh, I was just pretty good at it just right off the bat. I remember my friends, you know, trying to lift uh, a barbell or maybe tens on each side and they'd really struggle and squirm and, and lock one side out and that kind of thing. And I remember doing, you know, 95 pounds for like a few reps. And I was just like, I don't understand why <laughs> it's so difficult for these guys. Uh, but I've always been into many different forms of exercise. It's always just sort of been something that's called to me. Uh, when I was a kid and their commercials would come on and stuff, I would do like push-ups in between, you know, in, in between watching a show or sit-ups or just, I just always liked it. I did uh, boxing, track, um, all kinds of different things when I was younger. And then, and then being older, I think you, I think you sort of owe it to yourself to give yourself challenges because I think you need to try to find like what's, what's on the inside. There's stuff inside of us that's really powerful and really strong. There's things within us that we have um, that they're not going to really come out unless you're really challenged. And so I, I'm not going to, at this age, in this stage, I'm not going to challenge myself so much that I'm going to, to put myself in a position where I might you know, hurt myself like I would when I was younger. When I was younger, I wouldn't mind rolling the dice a little bit. Nowadays, I'm a little bit more cautious with it. But to be truthful is that if something's not dangerous, it's probably not, it needs to be a little dangerous here and there for it to be challenging enough for it to stimulate your mind, for it to be motivating in the first place. I think motivation is an interesting thing because I try to motivate people. I try to communicate a certain way to, to tell people to get out there and do it. Um, but what I've noticed from myself is that movement is motivation. Motion is the lotion. So once you get moving, a lot of times you get motivated. So what I would encourage a lot of people to do is like, rather than like waiting to be motivated to do the new thing or, or do this thing that you, you said you're going to do every day, uh, is just do a tiny bit of it. This morning, my wife was doing a Peloton workout, a body weight workout, and it's kind of challenging for me. I, my body is stiff. Um, my movement isn't amazing. It just it just sort of is what it is uh, from all those years of powerlifting. But I'm like, I can mimic a lot of the stuff they're doing. I can do some of these things. Let me just, so I did them. And certain things, I just, when I saw the instructor showing certain movements, I just, I didn't feel bad about it. I just chose to do a different version of it for myself. 
And once I started moving, then I gained more confidence. I got more motivated to do the workout harder. And then my wife was like, damn, like <laughs> you're not only you're doing it, but you're, you're, you're now surpassing some of the stuff that I'm doing. It's amazing. And I love that you reference this and we'll put the study up for everybody that's watching, but there was this huge meta analysis. It was over a thousand studies and it was like 130,000 study participants were included. And they found that exercise was 1.5 times more effective for reducing symptoms of depression mm. than pharmaceutical drugs and wow. psychotherapy. Not to negate the value of those things, but exercise just worked better. But you just said it a lot of times we wait for the energy. You know, we wait to not feel depressed to go and move when truly like moving starts to activate all of this chemistry in our bodies that makes us feel better. You know, so just having the, I love that you said that just a little bit, just do a little bit and you've created a life and what I've seen where it, it automates the process of getting that little bit in, right? So you've created an environment mm -hmm. to where the movement is just something that happens almost automatically. Talk about that a little bit. We call it, we call it microdosing. You know, some people hear microdosing like, oh, what's he going to share about like mushrooms or whatever? Uh, although I do like that kind of stuff as well. Um, I think it's great to microdose your fitness, microdose your exercise, and maybe even microdose your diet. You know, like you don't have to be on this crazy strict protocol all the time. And if you haven't uh, really participated in buckling down and trying to uh, fix your nutritional situation, you haven't had like a dietary intervention quite yet, then... Why not just take it like for a meal? Why not just say like, oh, the next meal, I'm not going to eat any carbs or the next meal. I'm going to really pay attention to the fat calories or the over. I just want to see what it feels like to eat a meal. That's a complete meal with whole foods. It's like 500 calories. And let me just see how I feel afterwards. So I think if we can break things down into smaller jobs, uh, I think it was Henry Ford that said, um, no job is too big if you break it down into smaller pieces. You break things down into smaller chunks and it's just more digestible. It's easier. If I said, hey, you got to do 100 push-ups every day, you might be like, oh, I don't know where I'm going to really sneak that in, 100 push-ups. But if you do five here, five there, you do five uh, sets of like, uh, or you do 20 sets of five reps or something like that, or the reverse of that, <laughs> uh, you end up with 100 reps at the end of the day. So I will work out before my podcast. I will work out after my podcast. I will sometimes work out before I work out. I sometimes will work out after I work out. Uh, this morning is a good example of that. I got up, uh, my body felt kind of stiff. So I was like, um, I know I'm supposed to kind of work out with my wife a little bit this morning, but I don't feel amazing. And then so rather than like reaching for stuff that's gonna give me energy, like a coffee or an energy drink, I think it's a good idea to recognize that your body can create its own energy. We already have tons of energy in us and on us. Um, here in the United States, we, you know, we don't have a lot of problems with, with that. We have plenty of nutrition in our system to go do something. And uh, you want to think about what are some things that um, your energy can be stimulated by. So your energy can be stimulated and released by exercise. So I just went out on a walk came back from the walk. My wife was already kind of in the middle of the workout. I was like, oh, well, I can, I feel a little bit better now. I can join her and, uh, and mix that in. I think it's really important that people grasp this concept of energy. Yes, it does come from calories. And yes, uh, it came from calories at some point. Uh, but the sun being outside, cold weather, you know, go outside when it's like, 50 degrees and pop your shirt off. Like it's, <laughs> it's not going to feel amazing, but three to five minutes of doing something like that, you're, it's going to feel like a really strong cup of coffee. It's going to feel probably even more powerful than that. Yeah. Yeah. And we know and this is something else I want to talk about. You know, you've been sharing content around this about, you know, bro science versus, uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, so-called conventional science and, What's so fascinating is that these simple implements, right? So we know, for example, when you're exposed to cold, right? Your mitochondria are ramping mm -hmm. up. They're doing different things, right? These energy power plants in our cells. And this is something that a lot of us have access to, even if we can. And I, I grew up in a situation where my power or the gas got cut off a time or 12, right? So mm -hmm. taking a cold shower wasn't a foreign thing, but it's different when you choose it versus <laughs> right. when you have to, you know what I mean? 
But just small things like that, getting some cold exposure, getting out in the sun. You know, we were talking before the show mm -hmm. that you were sharing the uh, episode I did on on sun exposure. And that's going to elicit all this chemistry that makes us feel good, you know, right. just getting out. But we have to get into it, get out of our kind of current rut. And that brings to mind some novelty, right? So you're here, you're out of town traveling mm -hmm. with your family. And even if we're kind of cooped up in our hotel or Airbnb for a while, just getting out in the environment, even if you are at home, every time you go outside is different. Yeah. It's not the same. Like we can, if you choose to, you can notice different things all the time, mm -hmm. right? And so that novelty, all these things start to stimulate us feeling better. I want right? to expand on that a little bit. Yeah. So you brought up something that I wasn't even really thinking of, but we can stimulate energy so many other ways. Novelty is one of them. Try something new or different, but try something new or different that is in your wheelhouse. You know, it doesn't feel good to do something that you really suck at. So something that you really suck at is something that you can kind of keep in the back of your mind, back of your head as like, that's kind of a blind spot for me. I'm not that good at that yet. And I'm going, I'm going to work on that, but like, let me work on that after I already feel amazing. That's not, not the first thing you're going to go to, because let's just say, let's just say you're thinking about doing like walking lunges, but your knees hurt. Don't tackle walking lunges at that point. Do something slightly different that will, um, and maybe it is new. Maybe it's still something novel, but we also have nostalgia. Nostalgia is huge. Throw on an old song, you know, throw on your old favorite song, whatever it is, throw on some Ice Cube or throw on some Metallica or whatever, whatever's your bread and butter. Like what's your song? What's your, what's your thing? What's your, is there, um, is there something from eighth grade or something that you're like, it just kind of reminds you of that time, puts you in a good mood. And then even beyond that, we have relationships, you know, um, you're bummed out. You're just like, well, oh, today sucks. You, you're, we're going to go for a walk. You had all these intentions of doing all these things and it's raining and you're just, you don't feel great. Your back hurts or whatever it is. Think of the funniest friend that you have in your phone and text them. <laughs> and be like, what's up, you idiot? You know, and just go back and forth with him. That right there will probably put you in a good mood. Like you ever have a friend that you can't even, the second that you see him because they're goofy and funny and silly, maybe you think they're like a jackass or something, but the second that you see them, you can't help but smile ear to ear. That's the kind of stuff that elicits and, and will just uh, really help the energy that you already have in your body to start to come out. Yeah. I want to lean into that more too, because when it comes specifically to training, the environment, the people you're surrounding yourself with, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. yeah you, if you walk with the lame, you'll develop a limp. You need to find like-minded people that want to get better. You need to find people that are hungry. They don't have to be like stronger than you or, or better than you per se, um, but it helps a lot if they're better than you. If they're flat out just better than you. That's Awesome. That's one of the reasons why I invited Insema to be on my podcast is because he is a bigger, larger, more jacked <laughs> version of me. And I find that motivating. I've always found that motivating. I've always tried to like, almost like be friends with, with the guy that's like that, the guy that's faster, the guy that's bigger, the guy that's smarter. Uh, if you hang out with smart people, you're going to become smarter over time. You hang out with strong people, you're going to become stronger. You hang out with fit people, you're going to become more fit. And so over time, you can kind of bypass a lot of things by just some of the people that you hang around. Super Training Gym, which uh, was a, a free gym that I had for over a decade. I recently uh, shut it down. We moved on to start to do some different things. But the reason why that gym was free was for selfish reasons for me, to be as strong as I possibly could be. And that's how the whole gym, that's how the whole thing started in the first place. Spending money that I didn't have, doing all kinds of things that, that were, um, yeah, it was you know, I didn't have money to buy a, a $3,000 squat rack and all these different things, but I figured out ways of making it happen because it was a dream of mine to get myself to be as strong as possible. And so I knew the only way that that was going to happen was if I'm not so motivated and so fired up to do stuff that I'm, that I think I'm going to do it by myself. I know that I probably could figure it out, but <laughs> I'd rather do it with friends. I'd rather do it with people and I'd rather have a good time doing it. Yeah, that's such a smart investment. You know, that's that's ROR, re return on relationships. 
Right. You know, you were making those investments and creating an environment to where eventually that led to a lot of success for you. But up front, you know, your <laughs> wife, I'm sure, was like, what the f is wrong with you? Yeah. You know, a hundred percent. I mean, it was a huge struggle at the time. I, I didn't have, uh, you know, when my wife met me, I, I don't know what happened. I don't know what I don't know why she picked me, but I, I got lucky because when she met me, I didn't have a car. I didn't have a bank account. I didn't have a driver's license. I sort of had a job, <laughs> you know, I was a bouncer and I was doing like whatever to make like ends meet, did some personal training and stuff. Um, but one thing I wasn't is one thing I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't a bum. I wasn't like not doing stuff. You know, I was always doing things. I was always trying to uh, work and I was always working on myself. And so sometimes I think people might think that that's a little bit of a selfish endeavor, especially when you maybe don't have the money to pay the bills and you're spending time, which seems like, it seems like you're spending a lot of time just dicking around with your friends, lifting weights. And that's kind of what it was. Uh, but I, even though it probably didn't seem to anybody that I had some sort of plan, I always had a plan. I always felt, and this is probably just came from my mother or my parents or something like that, but I always felt special. I always felt like I was going to be able to do something on maybe a different level than, uh, you know, just another guy that works out. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what she saw. You know, she saw that you were doing things, you know, you were trying to figure things right. out. And that's such a great character trait to have. And also, you know, you working as a bouncer at the time, a lot of people don't know this, but the movie Roadhouse is actually based on your life story. <laughs> That's right. hundred percent. That's why Jake Gyllenhaal got so shredded for it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Jake Gyllenhaal, Patrick Swayze. Yeah. And here's what's crazy. Before I knew they were remaking the uh, Roadhouse, I watched it probably, I don't know, a year ago. You know, I was just, one of those days I was oh, hanging out at great. home, threw that on. Yeah. It's pretty iconic. It's like... If looking back on it, it's not a really great movie, mm. but it's so not great as far as, you know, what you might put as ingredients for a great movie, <laughs> right, that right. it's great. Yeah, it's like it's, the best at what it is. It's a classic for sure. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the latest one they put out is just fun. Did you get a chance to see it? Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah it's Conor fun. Conor McGregor walking yeah. around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He looks huge. He's walking yeah. around naked half the time. <laughs> and uh, Jake Gyllenhaal looked crazy. He looked yeah. incredible. That It's just cool to see. Like, I am so excited and so pumped that on every podcast, uh, it, it kind of makes me, you were talking about bro science earlier. It just makes me like, yep. It makes me think, you know what I mean? Like, amen to this, because I've been doing this for so long. And now to finally get confirmation yeah. from every single podcast that talks about anti-aging or reversing your age or uh, trying to stay young and fit and healthy. So much of it comes back to muscle mass. So much of it comes back to strength. I do think that we have a tendency, especially here in the United States, to like really go way overboard with like overcorrecting, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and going the other way, uh, way too much. So... I think it's important that people, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal looked amazing in, in, in the movie, right? Like he looks incredible. Jake Gyllenhaal is probably a very, very healthy person, period. But I don't imagine that he's going to walk around that shredded all the time. I don't think that that's necessarily, maybe there's some people that can navigate that just fine. And maybe they have always been leaner. Uh, but to walk around at like 5% body fat or to walk around with like hardly a lot of times to get to that level, people will really reduce not just their calories, but they'll they'll reduce a lot of fat calories. And you start to plummet down your fat calories and your hormones and stuff. So, yeah. well, he may have been happy. His wife or significant other <laughs> probably wasn't too pumped about his decisions because uh, nothing really works other than like you can go to the gym and that's that's about it. But your energy isn't great at that point when you do things like that. Yeah, and that's what people don't really see when they see these magazines, for example, you know, we've had like Don Saladino here, who's trained a lot of these big screen actors mm -hmm. and he's been on magazine covers himself. And he'll tell you just, he, he can be relatively close, but he's going to have a few percentages, higher body fat walking around right. just to feel good. And I've done this, of course, myself been sub 5%, like 
four point six at Shame. one point. That's the worst I ever felt. 100%. You know, looking back on it. But the thing is, like you, you're you're walking around like this. And for me, I wasn't necessarily trying to have that low body fat, but it was the way that I was eating at the time. And of course, I was training. But just over time, you start to things get harder and harder to do, right? And also, you become, as you mentioned, with those hormones, and also fat works as an insulation mm -hmm. for your nervous system. So you start to become more sensitive more irritable, all these things, but this is very logical stuff. But, you know, aspiring to be a certain way and not putting it in a proper context is unhealthy. But with that being said, it gives us something to aspire towards as well, which is really cool, mm -hmm. but we need to have that kind of well-rounded education. And this is where we also uh, share this love for, you know, these aspirational, inspirational figures. Like, so when I'm talking about Roadhouse, for example, those are the elements that I loved, right? So we've got, you know, this guy who's like standing up against the bullies. We've right. got, you know, super fit. We've got the 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 martial arts. He like ripped the guy's throat out. Okay, <laughs> yeah. who does that? You know what I mean? And, you know, thinking about those characters that inspired you, you know, mm -hmm. like Sylvester Stallone, Absolutely. Arnold Schwarzenegger, all those things. We grew up in that age of that. And there was like a we we deterred from that a little bit and now there's kind of this resurgence but the coolest part about what you shared was that you're now seeing what you've been doing so long showing up on the big screen for example like a lot of these guys are using training methods and modalities that you've helped to popularize really mm -hmm. that you've been experimenting with yourself for decades and i love it because you know a lot of people are also tuning into you more to get it from the source, right? You know, which is really cool. So, how do you feel about that? <laughs> you know, I, I kind of you know, people hear me say all the time. I say strength is never a weakness, and weakness is never a strength. And I think that uh, we should keep our eye on strength. <clears throat> Not necessarily. You don't have to necessarily bench press something that somebody else bench presses. However, it, pretty much every person should start to do every person that lifts. And if you don't lift, you don't count. That's the saying of mine as well. Sorry for everybody that doesn't lift. You got to get out there and lift. Um, <clears throat> but when you're lifting, you should have an idea of like what kind of weights you can do on particular exercises. And so maybe it's normal for you to be able to bench press one plate for a couple of reps. Well, why don't we try to just keep that around for as long as we possibly can? Because that's going to show us a sign of some sort of youthfulness. That's going to show us a sign that you are still sending your body a signal. And if you just think about each thing that we're trying to do, all the biohacking, uh, you know, getting some sunlight in the morning and, and cold plunging and all these different routines and all these things, what are we trying to do? We're trying to send a particular signal to the body. So with strength never being a weakness and weakness never being a strength, I think we owe it to ourselves to try to keep a certain level of fitness, keep a certain level of strength, X amount of push-ups, X amount of pull-ups. How you lift or how you exercise is kind of up to you. you. There's a lot of different things you can do. And I say lift, you know, if you don't lift, you don't count. But some form of resistance, you know, if, if you're doing uh, rock climbing, it's like, I don't think you really need to spend a ton of time in the gym because you have a, a different approach. But, uh, you know, I learned so many, so many great things from powerlifting and powerlifting is let's see what you can do for a one rep max. And a lot of people are scared to do things like that. A lot of people are scared to go out and just give it hell and just go and sprint as hard as they can. Uh, they're, they're fearful of trying like a heavy squat and you should be because you can get hurt. And so there's really not, there's, I'm not encouraging people to go in the gym today and go and try a one rep max. However, what I am encouraging someone to do, learn the skill set of a squat. And then maybe over a period of time, you just say like, let me see what I can hit and still have my form be just dead on. I'll have somebody else watch it. I'll record it. I want to make sure that the technique is really there. So I'm not going to put on three plates when I barely made two plates look pretty good, right? Um, we see that a lot with people and they end up doing these reps that are just atrocious. So you want to try to, when you're working on your strength and just even working on yourself in general, you want to make sure that your reps always look really clean, that your reps always look really good. Um, something that I share with people often is that your, 
last rep of your last set should look like the first rep of your first set. So that's a really practical thing. So if you do three sets of 10 of something, your 30th rep, your last rep of your last set should look a little bit similar. Now, okay, there's going to be a little wiggle. You got some fatigue. I totally understand. And I'm not saying that you have to train that carefully all the time, but that's about what it should be. So now when you go to do a bench press or now when you go to do a squat, you don't have to be fearful that you're going to get hurt because you're doing with textbook technique and kind of back to the sprinting and stuff too. You'll hear people say, oh, you know, I think everybody knows sprinting is the best hands down. There's not even, it's not even close. It's just not even remotely close. There is nothing like sprinting. There's just nothing that mimics a sprint. But if you can sprint, you can probably fight. If you can sprint, you can probably get away. You can sprint. You can just, you have access to so many things. If you can sprint, you can probably jump. And if you're really good at sprinting, you probably can run pretty far too. Like someone like Hussein Bolt, who probably never really trained to run longer distances. I'm sure him running eight miles or something is, even though he'd probably hate it, it's not like his thing that he likes, he would probably still uh, be, be pretty damn good at it. So get try to figure out a way for your body to sprint. You know, if you're listening to this and you're 50 years old and you're like, well, my knees and my back, and I don't know. Can you sprint on an Aerodyne bike? You might say no. <laughs> Can you sprint on an elliptical? Can you, can you sprint with a curl? Can you sprint with an overhead press? Like maybe you can figure out like a certain amount of weight, maybe 40 pound dumbbells, pretty heavy to you. Again, with good technique and good form, maybe you can bring the weight to here and maybe you can figure out a way to like press it overhead. I think that that, some of those things I just mentioned right there, I think those are more of the key to our health and our longevity, more so even just, even something like jumping down from something. Um, I, I don't know if pe other people did this in school, but I remember like jumping down from the back of the bus in school in case there was an emergency or whatever. That would destroy most adults mm -hmm. now to jump down like that. But I remember being excited about that. Mm -hmm. Now I'm sure I would probably shuffle over to the edge and I'd probably look down and be like, <laughs> and it might be go to my butt and then and then go down so your ability to jump your ability to sprint these things are they're so crucial because of the signal that it sends to your body it's showing a sign that you're still youthful even something like getting on the ground yeah if you say hey man get on the ground and, and do some of these exercises with me if i circle around and i i move around a bunch like a cat <laughs> trying to like you know get comfortable on the ground that tells you immediately that i'm in pain but I was like, okay. And I just pop right down on the ground. It tells you something a little different. So I just wanted to mention all that. And I know it was a little long winded, but I wanted to mention all that because I think in the era that we're in right now, people think they have to be muscular. <clears throat> I don't agree with that. I don't think, so. I don't believe so. Even though I'm muscular, this is what I like to do. And what you like to do is actually in a different category of things, because what you like to do is massively important to your life as well mm. and massively important to your health as well. I just worked out yesterday with Mike O'Hearn. He's 253 pounds. He's probably like 55 years old. I don't necessarily agree with him staying, you know, above 240 or something like that all the way into his late fifties and sixties and stuff. But if he really enjoys that, if he really likes to do that, I could see the argument of like, I got to kind of back off of that and say, I think he's probably healthier doing what he really enjoys as long as it's not, as long as it's not clearly to his detriment. Yeah. I love that you were talking about the signals, giving our body these particular signals, whether it's being able to spend time on the floor, whether it's being able to jump off of something. And here's the thing. A lot of times we lose these capacities because we stop doing them. Yeah. Right. I was just thinking about my youngest son. We were walking somewhere. How old he? He, he's 12. And so we were walking and he he climbed up on something just to jump off of it. <laughs> right. And that's what we do. But then mm -hmm. we stop doing that stuff because we get the idea in our head. Usually it's before any type of injury happens, we just stop doing the thing. And then we get to a place years later that oh, I shouldn't do that thing. Remember when your son was seven? Right. Oh man. He, he didn't even just, he didn't walk to another room. He ran. My daughter jumped all the time. Yeah. My son ran all the time. And so I think that might be hard to like start to figure out how to microdose that right <laughs> into our own lives when you're 45 years old, but just 
can you start to think about that? Can you start to look at that a little bit and say, every time I park my car, I'm going to make it a goal to like literally get out of the car as quick as I can. It sounds like so silly or so foolish. When I get up from the dinner table, I'm not going to use my hands. I don't want people trying stuff and doing stuff that they're, they're going to hurt themselves, but maybe it's something that you work yourself towards. Um, a friend of mine, Joel Green, he actually will just, he's 57 years old and he will actually just sprint down the street randomly. And when he was on my podcast, he was wearing like nice shoes and he was, he was dressed uh, nicely. And I, I was like, even in those shoes, you know, he's like, it doesn't matter, man. I just take off just like a little kid. He's like, because again, that's the difference between a young body and an old body. So the inputs that we give ourselves, they, it can't just be the gym's not enough is what I'm trying to basically say here, going and doing a lifting session and growing out and just getting like muscular, uh, that might have some benefits and it might chew up more glucose and it might help us to be able to eat more and to be more lax with a diet or something like that. It can help us manage our body weight. Like there's a lot of cool things that it can do, um, but it can't really mimic that youthfulness that we're looking for. And so therefore I think you need other strategies. Yeah. The youthfulness is associated with moving quickly, right? We think of growing old as slowing down, right? <laughs> yeah. But are you proactively doing things to stay quick to stay fleet of foot, right? And so I love also you guys have been sharing some content around just like jump rope, for example, mm -hmm. you know, and this, these are things, again, these are like, they can be in the background of our awareness. But my wife told me, because this is one of the things that we do often, but she told me when she was in Kenya, little girl that they would jump rope. And I had no idea this first mm -hmm. time she told me, I've known her for 20 years. <laughs> and she told me that she used to jump rope when she was a kid. For me, people would do double dutch, you know, mm -hmm. the, the girls in the neighborhood, whatever. And these are all like fast twitch, quick, quick off the ground. Yeah. And these are things, there's even today, there's jump ropes that don't connect. You don't even have to have the whole rope to jump over. You could just do the action and mm -hmm. do a jumping motion that feels comfortable it's for you. Great for people to do. You know, and so it's just like, where can I get this input, send this signal for youth? And also we know today, and you've talked a lot about this, is that muscle is the organ of longevity. And so you're not saying that we got to walk around with a hunking amount of muscle, but adding some muscle to your frame is going to help you to age better. And so having you here, I want to talk about training. I want to talk about how do we most efficiently build some muscle, right? So I love, let, I love let me know. Kind of, I love this kind of stuff because I love, you know, we can get like philosophical and we talk about all kinds of different things, but it's great to just give people straight answers. Mm -hmm. And so there's many ways to get muscle. You know, some people get it from, they wrestled in high school and they got a big neck and, and they got a- Smile kind of Billy big, Roy. They got, yeah, they got, yeah, they got big arms. Uh, I have a friend um, that used to work for us. He had these massive biceps. It's just amazing looking biceps. And he got it from sprinting. It's like, you know, uh, sprinters have nice shoulders, and nice arms and stuff. But this guy had like 19 inch arms and <laughs> looked crazy. So sometimes people get hypertrophy from like particular sports, but the easiest way to get it specifically is to go to the gym and do some resistance training. And it's pretty simple. You want maybe to utilize two to three exercises, um, two to three sets per exercise. Now, as you start to do this more often, you might want to do a little bit more than that. Two to three exercises. Um, uh, two to three sets, two to three body parts, um, maybe uh, maybe per week. Maybe as you get more advanced, maybe it's two or three body parts per session, depending on how you want to do your split. And it's just kind of old school, Joe Weider style sets of 10. Something I found to be super effective over the years is uh, to do three sets of 10 and go light, medium, heavy. So you you're going to do incline bench press. And you have a little experience with it. So you, you know how to do the form and stuff and just grab whatever you consider to be light. You know, each person can be a little different, whatever weight you consider to be like kind of a joke weight, like that you can do. You want to get that first set in because that is where you do a diagnostic and you do an analyzation of yourself. Where am I today? Like what's, 
and and sure enough, you pick the weight up and you move it around and you're like, oh my God, there's like something going on in my wrist or something. Like, I don't know. That's strange. And so what do you do from there? Well, you're going to now audible and you're not going to go as heavy on the next two sets. You can kind or of- Or you uh, change your position. Yeah, yeah, right. You change your position. Uh, you're like, oh, well, a barbell doesn't feel good today. So maybe I'll try a dumbbell, right? And that's where you can kind of make these audibles as you go and you'll- You'll know how to do that a lot more as you move forward. Uh, but something like three sets of 10, light, medium, heavy, uh, chest as the example. You did incline bench. Now maybe you do, uh, it'd be nice to do maybe some push-ups or some dips. Uh, two to three sets, 10 reps. Um, then move on to uh, maybe like a cable crossover or something like that. Two to three sets of 10. That's a great chest workout. Now, depending on... How advanced you are, you might need to make it harder. You might need to put your feet up on a box for the push-ups. Um, if you are less advanced, you might have to do your push-ups off your knees or use my invention, the slingshot, which assists you in bench press, push-ups, uh, and dips. But that's kind of the basics of it right there. Two to three sets, 10 reps is a great start. How often do you need to train? What kind of frequency? That's always a really interesting question, but I just to flat out answer it, uh, I would say just two to three times a week. Something that I've found that might be of interest to people is that if you give yourself something that's too low, I like to aim low. I think aiming low is is crucial. I was talking earlier about sprints. The best way to do a sprint is to just go out and like jog real lightly, go as slow as you can. And then speed up, speed up, speed up. So you want to kind of ramp yourself up into it so you're doing it in a safe fashion, right? If we kind of take the same approach to weights, um, we're going to kind of ramp ourselves up into these things uh, slow and controlled. And so, you know, the way to get, the way to gain muscle mass, you know, over time is you're going to increase the intensity of the things that you're doing. Um, you're going to be brushing up against, uh, what I would call, uh, like a functional failure. Like you're, you're, you're no longer able to do a technical limit. They call it, you're no longer able to execute the exercise with good form and precision any longer. And, uh, that gives you an idea of when to kind of discontinue the exercise. But what the point I was trying to make about sometimes something's too low is that, if I just said, hey, I, you know, Sean, I want you to do uh, a 10 minute walk, you know, once a day, you might do it here and there, but it's like, there's like nothing to it. You're like, I don't know what the point in this is. So I do think it's great to aim low, but you still need stuff to stimulate you. So if you're in the gym and you're doing like these two to three sets, light, medium, heavy, and you want to ramp it up a little bit more, go for it. Like you're already at the gym. You're already there. You already spent the time to get yourself there and all these things. And so uh, that's where it might be a good idea to just say, this feels good. I like doing this. Um, instead of the three sets that someone recommended, I'm going to do five. Okay. Now you mentioned with the frequency. So are we talking two to three sessions per week on a certain body part? Ideally, yeah, I think so. The the uh, some people will say like on the smaller body parts that uh, maybe two or three times a week would be appropriate for those smaller body parts, and some people will say uh, on you know legs or or chest or back or something like that that maybe you only need to do it like once a week. Uh, the way I like to look at it is I personally like to do something almost every single day. Um, but I don't really recommend that to people that are new. I think people that are new, I think there's a lot of great things they could do. I mean, you can get an app and follow along with an app. You could get a trainer, something like that. But to commit to a trainer or to commit to this new time commitment out of nowhere is a, a tough investment for people sometimes. So while I enjoy exercising every day and I like to spread things out quite a bit, um, and because I exercise so often, I don't even really think about that question anymore. Mm -hmm. But for people that are newer, that are trying to like grow, let's say their shoulders, they want their shoulders to be a little wider. They want their back to be a little stronger, a little wider. Um, probably looking at like two or three times a week for those particular body parts and maybe other body parts where you're like, oh, I think my legs, my calves, or I think this or that like looks 
decent. I'm not going to worry about it as much, maybe only one time a week for those body parts. Right. Because we have this notorious term in our culture now, leg day, yeah. right? Which tends to be once a week. Right. And that's not necessarily ideal if you're wanting to gain muscle on your legs. Right. So what about the stimulus? Would you, let's just say that we want to grow muscle on our legs and we're going to do twice a week. Would you do the exact same exercises? No, I think you would want to switch it up for sure. And I think that uh, legs, you know, legs are with like running, sprinting, um, cycling, um, even just using like an aerodyne bike. Um, you're going to get, you get a lot of leg work from things like that. I mean, it just a spin class or something like that burns the hell out of your legs. There's actually a guy on Instagram. He's a famous uh, cyclist. He does those indoor where they got the aerodynamic helmet and everything. Um, he's called like Legzilla or something or Quadzilla on Instagram. His legs are just absolutely massive. And you see him doing these like single leg uh, split squats with like six plates on each side it's it is <laughs> it is wild i mean this guy looks like he can't walk but he has the craziest and highest like uh watt uh output like in the history of of uh cycling i think he's just just a monster so there's a lot of ways for your legs to grow so you might want to try to consider you know oh this day i'm going to do a little bit of plyos this day is going to be a little bit more jump rope. This day is going to be, I'm going to jump up onto a box handful of times. I'm going to uh, do a little bit of explosive training for today. And so that could be like a, um, you know, more like a, it's still going to be, it's still going to be something that might make your legs sore, but it's like a passive workout. And then you can have another workout that's more geared towards like straight hypertrophy. And that's actually a great rule of thumb for any body part really is to, Maybe you have one day where it's like a little heavier. You have one day where it's a little lighter. Um, with uh, with something like your chest, you could do more bodybuilding on one day and a little bit more power on another. So, for example, you could do like a five by five. You know, the the uh, the repetitions that you do dictate the weight, or the weight that you're thinking about doing can sometimes dictate the the reps. So the intensity. You know, sometimes I think people think the intensity refers to like you getting all hyped up and uh, doing like pre Smelling salts. Yeah, right. But the intensity is just the weight on the bar uh, in comparison to your one rep max. So you might want to vary intensities. You might want to have a day where you're doing, you know, bent over rows for sets of five because now you can overload yourself more. And just the word overload is an interesting thing. We're thinking about like what we're trying to do in these training sessions. If we think about it from a strength perspective and from like a bone density perspective, we do need uh, a certain amount of weight. If you're just like handling like 20 pound dumbbells and stuff like that, I don't think that's going to be sufficient. Even if the 20 pound dumbbells are heavy for you, um, while things are relative, I still think that over time, you're going to have to be able to pick up something heavier than just a 20 pound dumbbell. The good news is, is there's exercises for this. There's something called a bench press, there's something called a squat, and there's something called a deadlift. Those exercises lend themselves to, those are power lifts. Those are, those are lifts that you can usually handle some pretty good weight. Maybe for some people, the bench press might be an awkward one, um, but certainly on a squat and a deadlift. When I used to uh, do seminars around the country for CrossFit, I would do these powerlifting seminars and I'd say, uh, who here has lifted, you know, 400 pounds in the last, you know, few weeks? And there'd be a couple hands up and I'm like, okay, 500 pounds. Okay, 600 pounds. Be a couple hands up. And then when they would say, I would have the guy come up to the front <clears throat> and say, hey, what lift did you lift 600 pounds in? And they'd say the deadlift. And I said, well, what about your overhead squat? Did you, <laughs> did you overhead squat uh, 600 pounds? And like, nope. And so there's some exercises. There's nothing wrong with overhead squats. It's a great exercise. It's a great execution of uh, movement pattern, great execution of mobility and stability. Um, but there's some exercises that are going to be better for strength. There's some exercises going to be better for bone density, maybe to help you build um kind of like denser muscle like we don't there's there's a lot of stuff that we don't really truly know some of it's a little bit of a guess but it appears that some heavier training um builds a little bit different of a physique than a lighter training but i to me i'm always like well why don't we just do both 
you know, like developing a really good VO2 max and lifting weights. Those are both really good things. And then you'll have some people be like, oh, well, if you work on your VO2 max and take away from your, but we know differently now, like there's a lot of research now showing that uh, the two things <clears throat> can actually collaborate together and be beneficial. They can be synergistic rather than working apart from each other. But just in modern times and just thinking about like what people are trying to build and what people are trying to do. I think people want longevity. I think people, uh, they want to still be able to do stuff with good intensity. And I think for all the things that people are looking for, it just pops in my head all the time. Like, why not do both? Mm, I love that. Get you, get you a Mark Bell that can do both. <laughs> right. Um, so with this being said, I'm thinking about the, the guys that, you know, yourself included, but also that we know the majority of them, and there is a smaller camp that says, hey, one stimulation of a muscle group each week is enough. You need time to heal, right? Yeah. But that's a smaller percentage. Most of these folks say it's it's not enough. Like every two to three days, you need mm -hmm. to be hitting that muscle again if you're trying to grow that muscle. And so that leads me to this question about recovery because we do want the muscle to adapt, but waiting too long. Yeah. And by the way, caveat here, if you're just getting started, targeting once a week is fantastic, right? right? But what <laughs> happens when you get more advanced mm -hmm. and you wanna target a muscle group, working on that muscle group every two to three days, ideally would, right. would, would be great. But what about the recovery? Don't we need that muscle to heal up to a certain, uh, to a certain degree? You know, I think uh, we get into these things like when you're in your training, like whatever training you're doing, you know, you're only as good as like your last training session. You're only as good as like what you've been training previously. So sometimes you need to be prepared for what's coming next. And oftentimes when somebody feels run down, they feel overtrained, they feel like they need more recovery. Um, they could be right. They could just need some days off here and there. Like maybe they've been pushing it too hard, but more than likely they, the training that they did leading into the current training they're doing that they're struggling with, it wasn't enough to put them in position to be able to handle the current situation that they're in. Um, so you want to try to accumulate enough fatigue over time so that you can handle the new intensities, you can handle the new frequencies, because realistically, we should be able to put the muscles under a pretty good amount of stress every single day, um, regardless. I mean, if you're doing, you know, straight hypertrophy and you're trying to follow some of the things that I mentioned about doing, um, you know, two to three exercises per body part and doing two to three sets. And then over time, if you become more advanced, you might double those stats. So you might be doing um, <clears throat> five or six sets per exercise. And then you might be doing, you know, three or four exercises per <laughs> that body part. That starts to be really demanding. And the with the intensity that you're aiming for, uh, you can recover from that. You can get your body used to that, but uh, you would just be incurring like a lot of damage over time. It just wouldn't be worth it on the joints and on the body in general. And it probably would just register as like a negative stress over time. If you shotgun something and do it for like a short period of time, you can kind of get away with all kinds of stuff. Um, in general, I would say if someone's trying to like grow a body part and they have this like area that they just think is like stubborn, I think every few days, I think would be fine. You know, you want to build your arms up a little bit more. Um, working your arms every two to three days probably isn't going to be like detrimental in any sort of way. But you do have to account for how much your arm is moving around in your workout. Every, every press, every push is elbow. Every press, every push, every single time is elbow. Um, there's not a lot of stuff in the gym that you do where your arms aren't involved. Like they're, they're almost always involved <laughs> somehow, some way, right? You're holding on to something. So now, uh, now we're looking at like, how much can your elbows handle? How much can your shoulder joint handle? Even doing barbell squats. Even doing barbell squats, your arms are they're Yeah. They're very much involved. I mean, I've had people that, um, they can't squat for weeks not because of their knees, not because of their back, but because of their elbows, where they have to use what we call a specialty bar, like a safety squat bar or a cambered bar or some other different type of barbell 
that allows them to not have their arm in that same position any longer. And so we definitely do have to think about recovery. Recovery is, is critical. Um, but I think that recovery is something that we shouldn't really have to think about that much because our training is set up appropriately. So I guess you can look at it a bunch of different ways and say, well, if you just think about the workouts with recovery in mind, that would be a great idea. And I, and I do agree with that. But again, I just think, I know some people have gotten like rhabdo and stuff like that before. That's where the, the, the muscle tissues will just swell up tremendously. I think they end up with an issue with their kidneys from excess training. And uh, they're just having a hard time getting some of this uh, lymphatic system going, but their arms will swell up just in a crazy way. And you usually see it, you don't usually see it like in the legs. Because there's really not like you're you're not bending your legs like that much in a lot of workouts in the gym, although you could I guess from like squats or something. But it's usually around the elbow joint is where you see this, and you just have to be cautious of that. Every time you do like a row, any sort of back move, all back movements, they're all like <laughs> they're all elbows, so it's all forearms and biceps, and so your forearms and biceps are getting worked just excessively a lot of times. Something I like to think about with my own workouts is <clears throat> how do I get in? How do I sneak stuff in? So like if I'm doing a bench press, well, maybe for the day I'm doing more like a close grip bench press. Now I'm working my chest, but I'm also working my triceps tremendously. So now I don't really have to focus as much on the triceps. Once the workout is discontinued, once the workout is over, maybe on the way out the door, maybe I do a superset with uh dumbbell tricep extensions mixed with some tricep pushdowns. And that's like my triceps for the day. I wasn't really a huge focus of the training session. You can also do this with like mobility stuff as well. You can say, man, my shoulders are super stiff. Uh, and my, my triceps and stuff are kind of stiff. And you start to think of exercises that are going to open you up more. So now maybe you do things like dips. You intentionally do these movements and you go to do them and you're like, man, that shit, that really hurts. <laughs> well, you know, maybe you have to do it with a box under your feet and maybe you have to scale these things down a little bit. Say, I'm going to do this this way for a little bit because I don't want my range of motion to suck forever. I want to get better at this. And then maybe uh, take a tricep uh, motion, you know, back behind the head. So maybe you can wash the back of your, <laughs> back of your neck when you're in the shower, those kinds of things. You can get your body to uh, move and, and start to if you're if you're stretching through exercises, I found it to be really beneficial uh, for mobility as opposed to maybe just like a static stretch. Mm. Great advice, man. Great advice. This is priceless stuff, you know. And so, just to clarify, get right to the point with this question. So, we'll just say talking about the triceps mm -hmm. and the overhead tricep uh, move, and say we get a level of soreness, right? And Matter of fact, no, no, say we're extremely sore mm. and our tricep feels like ground beef. Yeah. We probably don't need to train triceps again the next day. Yeah. yeah you're probably good, you know, and this is where it's really helpful to have more strategies, you know, uh, all you can do is lift, you know, it's like, it'd be cool if you could do some other things. It'd be great if you can go out on a run. It'd be great if you did some cardiovascular training. It'd be great if you, um, even if your workout for the day was like dragging a sled and doing some lunges or something, you know, it's, it's good to have different strategies. So if your triceps or a particular muscle is super sore, um, you could train it that day, but you're better off not. I just want to elaborate a little bit more too on that because so many times people would say, man, my shoulder is killing me. I, you know, and I'm like, you bench twice a week, <laughs> you know? And I know like, you know, I'm in powerlifting and I'm a powerlifting coach. So a lot of these guys would come to me and I said, you got to take, you got to not bench press. Like don't bench with a barbell for a little while. Sometimes just one training session would make the hugest difference. Sometimes they need to take off a little bit more. Sometimes it was like two or three. But they could still usually train uh, m other muscles that are going to contribute to having a stronger bench press. So these are kind of the workarounds that you start to learn as you're in the game longer and longer. And they're super important to develop. I love this because what you were getting to is listening to your body, which is to. the ultimate, you know. 
Um, now, a great, actually, let me ask this instead. I want to ask you specifically about, you know, if we're training legs, what about maybe doing something that's a little bit more quad dominant, maybe mm-hmm. one hamstring exercise in the mix, but then you flip it the other leg day, right? You focus more on the Smart. hamstrings and a little bit less quad dominant. What do you think about that? That's a great way to do it. There's there's so many different ways we can train and there's, uh, you know, there's, there's so many things outside of like just training, you know, there's like time commitment, you know, how long are these workouts taking you? Um, something I used to do often is in between a uh, quad workout, I would do, uh, I would do calves or in between a hamstring workout, I'd sneak in some calves in between, uh, sometimes training the quads, sometimes I'd train the hamstrings because they're opposing muscle groups. They don't really take away from one another. So you can cut down your workout time quite a bit by doing stuff like that. Um, what you've mentioned is super smart is, uh, and you could do the same thing with biceps and triceps. You know, one day you really blast the biceps. You did like 10 sets for biceps and you did 10 sets for, or you did uh, five sets for triceps. You flip it around the next, the next, uh, next time you train. It's also a good way to kind of keep your muscles, um, from just being overworked. You know, if you did 10 sets for both sides, again, you were going to start to run into tendon and ligament issues. I think what we're really looking at when we're thinking about all this stuff is like, how, how do we do this consistently? How do we do it constantly and how do we do it for a long period of time because the game isn't tomorrow the game isn't like hey let's see what you can do six weeks from now the game is more like let's see what we can do from six years from now let's see what you can do 25 years from now to me that's the, those are the most important things i remember when i was young when i was probably maybe like 15 16 years old and i was doing like a squat and i just remember squatting i think it was like two plates or something i just remember just putting the weight in the rack and just i I remember seeing another guy he was in in the squat rack next to me moving around two plates and he was probably in like his 60s or so and uh i i saw him doing his squats and doing it with perfect form i was like i'd love to be able to do that like that's cool like this is cool like i'm on this journey and i'm on this mission to like lift all these weights and this is going to be like fun but that's super interesting that has always fascinated me. How do those, how are those guys doing it? So I think it's cool to really work for a, a body. It's really cool to work for strength, but we want to think about how do we do this for a really long time? Because if you're only going to look like this in your twenties and thirties, to be quite honest, anyone can do that. Mm. Anyone. Mm. But to be able to hold on to it in your forties and your fifties. It's elite. Yeah. In our culture. That's next level. Yeah. That's next level. Yeah, you're right. And that's a good way to put it because in other cultures, there's plenty of people that are probably in their 50s and 60s that can go and sprint any day of the week. Yeah, I love this. And also just circling back to the beginning of this conversation, it's qualifying ourselves to be able to do this stuff over time. Like you just mentioned, you know, you don't necessarily want to come in and try your one one rep max if you haven't been building up to anything. Qualify yourself over time. Give yourself, I love that you said this earlier, microdosing yeah. some of these exercises, some of these movements, and qualify yourself, build up so that you have the capacity to sprint, right? So maybe if that's your goal, if you were inspired by Mark and you're following him on Instagram, which you should be, and you're seeing him sprinting and it's something that you aspire to do and you haven't ran, you know, right. you haven't, you know, moved fast for 20 years. <laughs> Let's build up, let's add in. And the cool thing is we've got all of these accessory exercises because sprinting involves so much. You you said it earlier, I totally agree with you. There's nothing better. I think it is the quintessential (laughs) top tier exercise. It involves so much of our bodies and our nervous system, but certain things over time can become weakened. You know, if you're not utilizing your, you know, your Achilles and your ankle and all the bones in your feet and all these Mm -hmm. different things, you could start to microdose some of these different things to where you're building up those those uh, capacities, like just jumping, right? Maybe you just hop from one foot to the other, you know, a couple of rounds, right, through the day. Or maybe you just mentioned jumping off of something, for example. Maybe it's just one stair, yeah. all right? Maybe, you know, you're not doing the whole <laughs> staircase like you used to, but just jumping off one stair or just, you know, stepping down slowly or being able to, you know, stand on one foot for a while, 
right? Just Stand work in these different capacities. Or so yeah, it's tough. Hey, so many things are starting to fire, especially if you haven't given your body these different signals. One of my favorites, you know, and so we got to talk about balance. We got to talk about coordination. These are all really important things, and they they rarely get challenged in the gym. You know, if, if you're somebody that's been thinking about these things and you've been challenging them in the gym, then that's great. But a lot of times it really hasn't been thought about because we're just thinking about like big arms and big shoulders. And so we're just doing these uh, traditional exercises and those exercises, there's no need for them to disappear. Those are great exercises and they always will be. Uh, however, balance, coordination, rotation, um, the gym you have to be a little bit creative to sort of land on some of these things. Something that I do often, um, and this is a more recent practice, is I just, I stand on one foot and I just do a calf raise on one foot and I try to hold that position and I'm, I will do it on, I have these like slant board type things and I will do it with the slant board facing one way, with slant board facing another way. And it's ridiculous how hard it is. Like, I'm like, this is insane. I usually have to hold on to something because my balance starts to go. Um, but it challenges your feet, challenges your coordination. For some guys that are, you know, young, they're like, you know, why, why am I doing this? You're going to be doing some of these things to, again, build a capacity, uh, qualify yourself for the next level of things that you're going to do. Um, you remember this, I'm sure. Like, even when you're young, somebody challenges you or you go to do something and you just like tear something or you slightly injure something. Even when you're young, that happens. So it doesn't happen when you're like a little kid, but it happens when you're like 20 something and you hadn't played your sport for a while. And someone's like, Hey man, let's race. <laughs> and next thing you know, trying to impress somebody or trying to impress yourself, you, you know, blow out a hamstring or something like that. And so if we can think about a little extra work in the gym, a little extra, or even just think outside the gym. Like, let's just forget about the gym. A lot of times when I'm on, on a run, I do like parkour type stuff for me. You know, it's not anything that would impress anybody. People would probably look and they'd be like, oh my God, what is he doing now? Uh, the comments on Instagram, you know, of me sprinting and stuff has been funny, but it's like, guys, what do you expect? You know, what do you, ex how do you expect me to look? When I go to, when I go to run fast, I'm not, I haven't been working on that for many years. And even when I was younger, I always ran with my arms kind of flailing out. I always ran kind of stiff anyway, <clears throat> but I think we need to stop with the comments that we have in our own head. Mm -hmm. You know, if you said, Hey, you know, um, Mark, you know, try this, uh, this one, this one legged, you know, hop, just hop on one foot 10 times. A lot of times you'll see that person right away. They'll, they'll go, oh, I'm, I'm, I set my balance sucks. They're like trying to throw something out there just to, just to make you aware it's going to be like difficult for them, you know, and, and they don't want to feel foolish. Right. But we need to stop saying stuff like that internally. It's, it's super, it's very damaging. And what we need to recognize instead is it's just new for you. Like get, cut yourself some slack. Think about if you were training a kid or you're training your own child or showing your own child something, um, you show them how to throw the ball. You don't yell at them like, you know, like a maniac. You say, oh, okay, you know, you want to try it more this way. You try it more this way. And you start to see that they're either like getting it or they're not. And you're like, okay, I need to do the hardest thing in the history of the world for a parent, not to just shut up. And you need to let people work through things, right? But we don't allow ourselves to do that. We don't give ourselves like the grace or the time. It's day one, man. Like day one on dips and you have tight shoulders, it's going to hurt. Your elbows are going to hurt. Day one of you, you know, listening to this podcast and you heard me earlier say, you know, getting on the ground. Getting on the ground is the place where we rest. We need to use the ground more. We need to use the furniture less. Doesn't mean we can't use the furniture. It doesn't mean you can't just chill and blob out and watch some TV and, and hang out. <clears throat> but getting on the ground for a lot of people is, is a place of pain. That's why people don't do it. But you should be able to engage in hard things. You should be able to handle hard surfaces. Um, even just simple stuff like our feet. Like our feet are, we're so used to just being inside. We're so used to wrapping our feet up in these cushiony things. And then going outside and traversing the earth that way, 
But in general, I think a good life philosophy is to have many, many strategies on how you traverse whatever terrain is coming your way tomorrow. Now, one of the other things that I've learned from you is that, and also just your, your, your community, you know, in SEMA and just really paying attention to, again, people who figure some things out is that there isn't just one right way to do a thing, right? And now this is not to negate the need for, quote, proper form on certain movements, mm -hmm. but sometimes moving around within a movement is going to yield more results and also give us the opportunity to, in a way, be more realistic. Because a lot of times when we're using our bodies in the real world, for example, if we're playing a sport, life mm -hmm. isn't coming at you in one very kind of mechanistic movement, right? Like with a squat, for example. So being able to change positions. Recently on Instagram, you you shared a video where you were demonstrating different ways to do a cable fly. You said, rather than just moving the weight, you can move around the weight. So what do you mean by that? <laughs> Again, there's so many different ways we can do all this training stuff. So you can move, you can, you can move a weight, you know, you're doing like a cable crossover. You can kind of move your arm, right? You're moving the cable. The cable's moving. You see the weights going up and down. You can actually kind of hold a position and have the cable and have the cable literally not move at all and activate your muscles really well just by simply rotating towards that side. And then you can rotate to the other side. The thing that's cool about stuff like that is we can rotate like you, we lose, we lose uh, like proprioception of a lot of these things. And unfortunately, like these things like die, like they, the cool thing is they can come back, but they also die. And so you have to, when you start to try to move your body in certain directions, you know, you, you might, you might say, okay, I'm in this fixed position. I'm, I'm facing forward. I'm going to tilt my hips towards the wall. And then you kind of do your hips, but you realize that you're moving your shoulders as well. And then you're like, wait a second, let me try that again. Let me try just the hips. And you realize that you can actually move just your hips and keep your shoulders still. And this takes a lot of practice and super annoying. You're like, oh my God, how come I can't, how come I can't uh, have them be separate from each other? The more athletic that you are, the more likely you are to be able to uh, hone into that or the more practiced you are with it. If you're doing, um, if you're like, my wife is a swimmer, so sometimes people get lucky like with the sport that they love or that they really enjoy and it just has a certain rhythm to it where it plays into that or maybe you love dancing or something like that and you're gonna just you're gonna be able to kill it with a lot of this stuff but there's no reason why we have to be so boxed in with just traditional exercise there's so many different ways of doing it and so rather than uh just thinking about just moving the weight with our arm or just moving the weight with our legs um, let's start to think about maybe we can move our body around the weight. One of the, my favorite things to do is to utilize weights as a counterbalance. And you see this done in something like a goblet squat. But then it's interesting because like this stuff is like utilized in one place and then it's like not utilized anywhere else. And you're like, why wouldn't we just try to adopt this and use it in as many places as possible? So I love to load up a cable machine and the Cable could be high, medium, or low. It doesn't really matter. Just walk away from that machine, holding on to the, uh, holding on to the handle. Uh, walk, you know, take many steps backwards, and just go ahead and sit right into a squat. And regardless of your mobility, regardless of whether your mobility is uh, horrific or whether you have pretty good mobility, um, you'll be able to get down into a really nice squat. Now you need to load the weight with a weight that's going to help you to get in position because for someone that's super mobile, they don't even really need the counter balance weight, right? But for somebody that uh, is heavier, for somebody that really struggles to get in position, they're gonna need to kind of load the weight up. So they might need to use the stack or half the stack to be able to do this. But this is an amazing uh, thing to be able to do. And then you, you kind of just hop down in that squat position and your, your butt is next to the ground. You can actually, literally just fall backwards because you have that counterbalance weight. You can hold it with two hands or one hand, whatever feels good or safe to you. You can kind of rotate and move your body around. As you're in this squat position, you can start to try to move your hips around. And what I've learned is my hips don't go anywhere. <laughs> my back doesn't go anywhere. It's actually, you know, years and years and years of 
building up a lot of strength in my spine. I didn't really understand it or realize it at the time, but what I was doing is making myself insanely rigid. And I, I just, I kind of knew it because I knew I was bracing for a thousand pound squat <laughs> and stuff like that. And I, I recall uh, when I would squat those big weights, I would say, all right, let's lock it in and just don't move. The only thing that's going to move is like my legs and my butt. I'm going to drive my knees out, but my posture is going to, I'm just not going to move from this position at all. Tree trunk. Yeah, tree trunk and just not moving. And that strength ended up ironically becoming a weakness <laughs> nowadays because uh, it's hard for me to move in some of these positions. But what I'll do is I'll stay in that uh, bottom position of that squat and I'll try to move whatever parts of my body I can move around. And something I'm learning is that I mistakenly will negatively sit, tell myself that I'm stiff, but stiff compared to what? Um, tight compared to who? Like why, why worry about it? Right. I feel good. I don't have pain. I don't have symptoms. So why the comparison? Like what, you know, why am I expecting myself to be able to move like a yoga instructor or be able to move like, uh, someone who's been practicing martial arts for 20 years? It doesn't make any sense at all. So I need to give myself some grace and some space with that. But with this particular exercise, another cool thing is you can just fall all the way back. You can just be on your butt. You can be on the ground. You can put your legs out. You can kind of do what's called like a pancake. Some people may have seen Ben Patrick do this exercise and you can just uh, go as far forward as your body can handle. But I'm doing stuff like this in between other exercises. So I'm, I'm mixing, you know, some old school, you know, bro science and bro workouts uh, in with some more modern day like movement pattern things. Because you're going to see, you know, on, on Instagram, you see a lot of people talking about these, these particular movement patterns. And what they'll say and what they'll share with you is they'll say, you know, these movements, you know, these are the best movements and these are for this, this, and this. And I agree with that a lot. I actually think that a lot of these movement practice people have some really great points. Um, lifting weights can make you stiff. Lifting heavy can create stiffness. But... What if you're also practicing other things while you're on your journey for, while you're on your fitness journey, while you're on your journey to get jacked? What if you're also uh, doing some couch stretches? What if you're also moving around in a bunch of different ways? What if you're also still playing a sport? Playing a sport is a great way to not have to really worry about stuff quite as much because you're getting in all the stuff we talked about earlier, the coordination, uh, the fitness. If you play pickup games of basketball, you're, you're getting in a lot of cardiovascular training. You're getting in tons of coordination. So you might not have to be the person that's like balancing on one foot in the gym. You might have to worry about it as much as the, uh, as the other person, but I'm blending these exercises in and it's been really, uh, it's been really fun to be able to do that. And now be able, being able to get myself to a point where I can sprint, get myself to a point where, um, you know, if someone's like, when I go and meet somebody and go and do their podcast, some people, they like to run, some people like to do CrossFit, some people like to bodybuild, some people like to power lift. <clears throat> I can be down for any of it. I could, yeah enjoy doing any of it with them and i i think i uh i think i should pat myself on the back for that a little bit because of the way that i lifted for so many years it's amazing i was able to survive <laughs> some of those heavy lifts that i did years ago mark bell is dfw down <laughs> for whatever i <laughs> yeah. remember that man this has been so awesome so many incredible insights um again can you share your instagram handle and also your YouTube channel is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So many great shows there. Of course, I've been on there a couple of times, yeah. honorably. And uh, man, you guys are just some of my favorite people. Thank you so much. Yeah, you've been on the Power Project. I appreciate that having you on. And we got to have you on again because you're just, you're one of a kind. I love the way that you deliver your message. I love all the research. I was going to ask you, I need to ask you this before we drop off of here. How do you do your research? Mm, so is this for everybody? Yeah. Awesome. For everybody. Awesome. Of course. So, <laughs> you know, I've been, this is t year 21 for me. And so I went to college, you know, like 1997 was my first semester when I went to college and being somebody, well, you know, this is going to be unique to everybody, by the way, 
but our different different learning styles as right. well. And for me, conventional education wasn't really difficult. You know, I didn't really have to try very hard. Mm. A lot of times, it's a true story. I've never really even shared this, but my wife knows. She talks shit about this a little bit. But a lot of times, I didn't even buy the books. Mm. You know, for classes which they're ridiculously expensive. Yeah, right. You know, partially, and I'm just like, I can get that refund from that scholarship or that grant into my pocket. I don't mm -hmm. need these books, right? And so for me, what it was was just paying attention. You know, just when I was in class, really paying attention, taking great notes, really helped as far as tests are concerned. Mm -hmm. But I was very acclimated to doing research on my own, you know? So whatever they were talking about, if I can go to the lab, which I mentioned the 1997 part because computers were not everywhere at the time. Yeah, yet, yeah, yeah right? right. And so um, there was still Dewey Decimal System kind of crossover, but I would go to the lab at my university and I would research things online, right? And I would go to reputable sites, right? And so over time, it's become easier and easier because mm -hmm. so many of these published studies are on sites like PubMed, for example, and you know, kind of housed by the NIH even. And right. the, but here's the rub. Not all of these studies are credible. And you've got to look at, you know, who's funding the study. Mm -hmm. You've got to look at how the study was constructed. A lot of times we'll go and grab something from an abstract, a summary of the study, and base our whole belief on that. And what we tend to do is we look for things to affirm what we already believe. Right. That's the natural right. human inclination. And so over time, I challenged myself, and this is what, again, it just goes back to what you're talking about. I challenged myself to, to think differently. Mm. I challenged myself to look at things that don't necessarily resonate or agree with what I believe. And so that gives me a more well-rounded assessment. And also it gives me a great place to make counterpoints for things that, you know, maybe the argument is against what I believe, but right. now I have, I, I can start to understand why someone, someone or a researcher or a scientist would even think this, right? And so I can start to perspective take. And so I'm saying all this to say, yes, looking at published research is wonderful, running experiments myself as well. And also this brings the most important point, which anecdotal versus peer reviewed, all right? Mm -hmm. We have to stop negating the value of an N of one, your own personal experience right. for your life is the most valuable form of research. But we have to pay attention and we have to challenge ourselves. We have to ask questions. We can't just, if we do a thing and we get this one result and to think this is the end all be all, of course. But if you found things that work and this resonates exactly with what you're talking about, looking at some of these iconic, you know, bodybuilders, um, you know, power lifters, this might not be in a published peer reviewed study, right? Be the most effective way, yet. but look at the, <laughs> yeah, right. Yet. And that's the funny thing today was just yeah. affirming what you've already known, but we don't have to wait around for the science to conclude that this thing works or doesn't work. Mm. And so paying attention to that end of one, paying attention to yourself, and also paying attention to your friends and family and community. And, and even though it might not have a peer reviewed reference to go with it, that doesn't mean that it's not valid science. Mm. Science is paying attention to outcomes. Science is having a hypothesis or a theory, putting the, the thing into action and seeing what happens. And that can happen for so many things that aren't necessarily getting funding right now. And so to answer your question, yeah. You know, it's it's all of it. A real scientist is constantly questioning, is constantly looking at outcomes, and yes, paying attention to published data, yes, but paying attention to what's going on in the real world. Yeah, you're like a great resource for that. And I think when I watch some of your stuff, I just think of you almost as like a reporter. It's like you went and did this deep dive on this particular subject, which is cool, because I think a lot of times we just see people just maybe reviewing like one study but you'll bring up multiple ones and you'll say, I also found this out, like all the stuff about sunscreen and all the stuff. It's really cool. I think we've heard some negativity about sunscreen, but you only kind of, we just pick up like the little headline thing. Maybe someone talks about one study, but you're talking about like multiple things. And I think it's really helpful. Thank you, man. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot. I spend a lot of time <laughs> doing it, but that's the thing too. I love it. You know, going back to what you shared earlier, like the joy factor of something, even if something is arduous, mm -hmm. maybe even it stresses me a little bit, but the fact that I love it, 
that adds more fuel to the fire and it just helps. It, it also comes through when I'm teaching it too. So it's yeah. great. I just want to share one more thing before we hop off, but you know, can you, kind of to your point of like doing something that you love and doing something you enjoy, I think it is really important, but I see too many people, um, doing the thing that they love to their detriment. So just be a little yeah. cautious with that because it is a little bit like playing with fire. And when you start to really enjoy working out, you're like, oh, I could still do this workout even though my shoulder hurts. You should probably just, there's nothing wrong with taking a day off. <laughs> you know, yeah. we got to remember that. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell on Instagram, uh, YouTube. Um, you can check out, yeah, Mark Smelly Bell is a YouTube channel, Super Training 06. Um, and uh, my podcast is uh, Mark Bell's Power Project. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Of course, it's my honor. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. We see situations where people will actually have pain when there's no tissue damage, but they believe there's the potential for it. And when you can make people believe there's the potential for tissue damage, you can create pain 